Harvard Divinity School. Psychedelics and the Future of Religion series, initiated by the Spirits, February 9th, 2023. Welcome. My name is Charles Stang, and I have the pleasure of serving as the director of the Center for the Study of World Religions here at Harvard Divinity School. Welcome to this evening's event. We are pleased to be restarting our very popular series on psychedelics and the future of religion, and we're delighted to have with us this evening Frederic Apfel Marglin and Randy Chung Gonzalez, who are joining us from Lamas, Peru. I'll be speaking with them about their new book, Initiated by Spirits, Healing the Ills of Modernity Through Shamanism, Psychedelics, and the Power of the Sacred. Before we dive into that conversation, however, allow me to plug an upcoming event in our Nociology series, led by my colleague Giovanna Parmigiani. On Wednesday, February 22nd, from 12 to 1 p.m., Giovanna will be hosting Dr. Amy Hale and Dr. Krista Shushko to discuss Dr. Hale's uh, new edited book entitled Essays on Women in uh, Western Esotericism, Beyond Cirruses, Seer, <laughs> Cirruses and Sea Priestesses. Forgive me, that's quite a number of S's. That will also be a Zoom webinar like this, and we will put uh, the link to register in the chat function. And as always, the best way to stay abreast of what we're doing here at the Center and its programming is to sign up for our weekly newsletter. Since my questions for Frederic and Randy will prompt them to speak of their own lives and their own work, I'm going to keep my introductions brief. Frederic uh, Apfel Marglin is Professor Emerita in the Department of Anthropology at Smith College. She's also taught at Harvard, Wesley, Wes, Wellesley, and Wesleyan. She founded the um, Sachamama Center for Biocultural Regeneration in the Peruvian High Amazon in 2009, which she now directs. She's a very prolific author, and her most recent book, apart from this one, is uh, co-edited with Stefano Varesi and is entitled Contemporary Voices from Anima Mundi. Randy Chung Gonzalez is a self-trained architect and visual artist who was born and raised in Lamas, Peru. In June of 2016, he was initiated by disembodied spirits into shamanic knowledge and power. And since then, he's been given powers by other indigenous spirits, as well as the Virgin of Guadalupe. He currently, I'm sorry, he receives regular teachings from a disembodied shaman. He offers healing to others, and he directs an ecological center in the forest called, in English, the place of the sacred mountain. And here's a brief description of the book they wrote together, this book initiated by spirits. Randy Chung Gonzalez was leading an ordinary life in his hometown of Lamas, Peru, when his employer asked him to accompany her to an ayahuasca ceremony led by a local shaman. There, to everyone's great surprise, Randy was initiated by disembodied entities who instructed him and gave him healing powers. In this unique book, Randy tells his story to Frederic, who offers cultural context and describes how she herself has been transformed from an academic anthropologist to an advocate for the sharing of indigenous wisdom and eco-spirituality. Initiated by the Spirits argues powerfully that shamanic sacred plants can heal the ec epidemics of mental illness in Western societies, as well as the global ecological crisis. Randy's shamanic initiation serves as a beacon for new ways of conceiving of the human relationship to science, spirit, and our planetary home. So here's how the evening will unfold. I'll spend the next 45 minutes or so posing questions to Frederic and Randy about their book and its implications. Then we'll transition to Q&A from the audience. So if you'd like to pose a question or a comment, please do so with the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And please do indicate if you'd prefer that your question be anonymous. We'll probably only have time for some of the questions, but rest assured that we'll pass on all your questions and comments so that Frederic and Randy can see what their remarks provoked in you. So at this time, let me welcome our guests to the screen. Frederic, Randy, can you please appear? There you are. Welcome. Welcome. 
Thank you. <laughs> to see you. Thank you so much for joining us, and thank you for writing this remarkable book, which, as I told you, I have just finished this morning, and I enjoyed it enormously. Very, very clear, very compelling, um, and so I encourage everyone to uh, to get a copy. And um, appropriately enough, it's available on Amazon. Okay, now uh, I have a series of questions, and um, uh, the first one, uh, let's start with a bit of narrative biography, or rather autobiography. So your colleague Stefano Varesi has described your new book as, quote, a heretical anthropologist and an unorthodox shaman in a profound mystical and intellectual dialogue. Frederic, can you tell us how you came to be heretical in the field of anthropology and why? And what exactly makes Randy's shamanic calling so unorthodox? I'll try my best. <laughs> I thought about this question and I think that uh, what Stefano is referring to by calling me a heretical anthropologist is the fact that in, I have abandoned the modern paradigm, uh, materialist paradigm, the mechanicist paradigm, as Rupert Sheldrake calls it, that was created, invented, especially in the 16th and 17th century in Western Europe uh, during uh, the so-called scientific revolution or mechanicistic revolution. So because I do not hold to that paradigm which is presented, was presented from the beginning and continues to be presented, not by everybody, but by the majority as universal and as reality, too cool, just reality. I don't share this. So, and I don't share the dualism between nature and culture, uh, which is foundational to anthropology. So I guess that's what Stefano was thinking about when he called me a heretical anthropologist or some of the things. Now about Randy, um, I think that the reason he calls it unorthodox in my view are two, basically two reasons. One, he was raised by, a secular, by secular parents, uh, which is very unusual in the region here in Lamas. Uh, they were secular and he had absolutely no knowledge of religion, none whatsoever. Uh, so that makes him unorthodox. And the other is that he was initiated against his will. He did not welcome it. He tried to abandon it halfway through, but could not by uh, disembodied uh, beings. In the region, this is never happens. I have been doing ayahuasca here and in the region for some 25 years. Uh, the, my friend, uh, the, the Dr. Jacques Mabit, uh, an MD, a French MD who, who, who trained with elder shamans um, very near here, uh, who, and the spirits told him he needed to uh, start healing drug addicts. There was a lot of uh, addiction in this area because it was a big area for uh, coca growing. This is where coca grows naturally and the, the business of cocaine. So a lot of people got addicted. Uh, so Jacques has been uh, in the center for uh, 30 plus years in Peru, more than that, married to a Peruvian MD. And he knows he, he's been in this business as it were for a very long time. And he says, this never happens. And his wife came in while Randy was there and she said, this never happens. And I had never heard of it. And I had done ayahuasca ceremonies with many, many, many different shamans. So that's why I think uh, Stefano called him unorthodox. Thank you. All right, let me move on to uh, an, my second question, which is also about the second part of the book. And in that book, in that second part of the book, we hear from Randy in the first person 
describing his extraordinary experiences, his visions with and without the sacrament of ayahuasca and of the various disembodied, uh, disembodied spirits he meets, including a shaman who would come to be his master and a woman whom he would later come to identify as the Virgin of Guadalupe. So Randy, could you please tell us about that experience with the woman and how you came to identify her uh, with the, fair, the famous Marian apparition who first appeared to an indigenous man named Juan Diego in the year 1531 outside of what is now Mexico City. Eh, bueno, después de una sesión de ayahuasca con el doctor Jack, eh, al día siguiente me citó a su oficina para tener una, una, una conversación sobre la experiencia de la sesión. Y bueno, la cita fue a las seis de la tarde, eh, me acerqué a su oficina y empezamos a conversar. Y él tenía algo en duda sobre el, el yachay eh, que me dieron, ¿no? Una duda si era de, de brujo o era de curandero. So it's like that. I brought him, uh, but first of all, his, his initiation happened in a ceremony where I forced him to come with me. <laughs> he didn't want to come. And this is at the center of an indigenous Quechua uh, shaman. And it was so, what he told me afterwards was so amazing that I soon thereafter brought him to Dr. Mabit's, Jacques Mabit's um, center. Uh, for an ayahuasca ceremony. And after the ceremony, uh, Dr. Jacques and, and Randy uh, uh, made an appointment because Dr. Jacques wanted to uh, check whether the master that appeared to Randy without ayahuasca in his bedroom, a day or two after his initiation, uh, whether he was a sorcerer or, or a good shaman, a healing shaman. And uh, Dr. Jacques uh, began a, a process uh, in his office on Randy, which was a kind of exorcism. Mm -hmm. eh, entonces, eh, estuvimos en la, en la oficina del Dr. Jack y el Dr. Jack se acercó para hacerme algo como un exorcismo entre cantos, ícaros y soplos. Y bueno, sacó un, un libro que era en latín que leía agarrándome la cabeza y es ahí donde se me la visión se me hace como una niebla roja y es ahí donde aparece la primera visión que tengo sin ayahuasca se me aparece una mujer de tez morena con una sonrisa así un arete de perlas un collar de perlas y un manto con un bordado so he um, he's in the office and sitting uh, and Jacques takes a book and reads in what uh, Randy thinks it's Latin, because he didn't understand it in Latin, a long thing with his hand on Randy's head. And uh, while uh, Jacques is reading Latin to, to Randy, uh, first uh, Randy sees a, everything red, mm -hmm. like a red fog, if you will, and out of this red fog, comes the face of a young woman uh, of brown skin, like his own, and uh, with uh, two pearl earrings and, uh, and a necklace and a mantle and a lovely smile. Hmm. And, uh, and uh, then from the side comes the, the master, Ashaninka, disembodied master Ashaninka that had previously tried to give him his, his uh, knowledge from his mouth to Randy's mouth and who kneels in front of this woman. And Randy is describing everything to Jacques. Mm. And Jacques then immediately says, okay, takes his hand off his head and he says, your master is not a sorcerer. Entonces ahí donde me dice que tenía un cuadro de la Virgen Grande en el costado de su escritorio, me, me enseñó con el dedo, es eso, y era, era lo mismo. Pues, y ahí me explicó que era la Virgen Grande. So he shows him, at that moment, he shows him 
a picture of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And he asks him, is the woman you saw the same as this one? And Randy says, yes, it's the same woman. And Jacques explains to him that she is the Virgin of Guadalupe that Randy had never heard of, by mm. the way. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I think that's a wonderful opportunity for us to show some of the images that you've included in this book. So um, Kama, who is helping us on the technical side, is going to bring up some of Randy's illustrations. Uh, wonderful. Now, let me just, um, I'm going to pose a question uh, to you both, uh, Frederic and Randy, but, but feel free to, to do with these images what you wish, give whatever commentary you wish. Um, but I'm going to phrase this as a question to Randy. Randy, you've rendered your visions into these powerful images, black and white ink drawings. Next one. Tell us more about what led you to represent your visions this way. Were you an artist before these encounters? Uh, how did these encounters change your art, both in terms of the style of representation, but also how you approach your artwork? And what role do the images play, if any, in your shamanic practice now. Tu era artista antes, porque como cambió tu arte y si lo utilizas en tu trabajo. Sí. Bueno, con la experiencia que tuve de la iniciación, yo antes de eso yo había dejado ya de pintar, no, hace cinco años más o menos. Eh, no estaba mucho con la pintura y después de la iniciación todo eso eh, eh, lo que hizo esta experiencia de la iniciación fue de que eh, me encontrara con este estilo de las ilustraciones entonces era algo que ya yo había experimentado había visto y se me hacía fácil ya empezar a, a, a dibujar con ese estilo de tinta no so what he's saying is that he was a painter uh, painted with acrylic, I, I believe, uh, paintings, uh, some that I love, <laughs> many that he sold. Uh, but he had stopped painting for about five years before his initiation. He was busy with other things. And it is his initiation that, out of his initiation, that he developed this mode, which is absolutely, he explained to me uh, that. He does it with a ink pen, black ink pen, and he cannot erase. So it's done in one, <laughs> in one movement. Mm. He cannot change anything, which I find absolutely extraordinary. Um, and then about, uh, he does not use these images in his shamanic practice. In shamanic practice, he sings, uh, the shamanic song is called Ikaro, mm -hmm. uh, and he plays some instruments. By the way, I just add that I've known Randy since he's 15, he's now 40, and uh, he never sang, never used an instrument, and the music he produces during ceremonies is, for my taste, absolutely extraordinary. Wonderful. Um, Frederic, would you like to, uh, Kama's doing a wonderful job moving through these slides. Are you happy with that as I continue to ask questions or is there any commentary you want to give on the images? That... No, I mean, it's self-explanatory. Uh, mm -hmm. The Virgin of Guadalupe appeared. This is the, you see this tilted pyramid is the sacred mountain, sacred to the local indigenous group, the Quichua Lamistas. Kichwalamas. And it means, Waman Wasti means the place or the house of the eagle. And when he invoked this eagle with an offering, this is a long story, the eagle came, came to him like that. Mm -hmm. And with a hand that seemed like a snake, gave him something to drink, mm -hmm. which he drank. And it was so painful. He was saying to the person who was there with him, I can't stand it. This is too hard. And the man said, you have to take it. Come on, do it. And he did it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so he received 
powers from the Virgin and from other, and from the, the Shaminka master and from others and from the mountain, sacred to the local indigenous people. So one of the things that comes through in the images that are up is that some of them were experienced under the influence of ayahuasca, but, but many were not. Um, is there any significant difference in the quality of the characters of those visions with or without ayahuasca? And do either of them hold more authority for you personally, Randy, or for those whom you serve? Well, the last imagen is las con ayahuasca o sin ayahuasca tienen más fuerza o más autoridad para ti. Estamos hablando de lo que estaba antes. No, no, no. Esas. ¿Cuál tiene más fuerza? Los que, lo, lo que veías con ayahuasca o los que veías sin ayahuasca. Eh, la, la que me impactó más fue la que veías sin ayahuasca. ¿no? Pero eso no quita la esencia cuando también veía con, con ayahuasca sino que era lógico para cualquier ser humano ver te aparece de la noche a la mañana y ver estas imágenes es una impresión muy fuerte eh, de, de comprender y de aceptar también porque todo ha sido un proceso poco a poco para ir aceptando. So what he says is that uh, actually the ones that have affected him more powerfully are the ones without ayahuasca because he did not expect them. Mm -hmm. at all they came upon him usually at night when he was in bed mm -hmm. and uh, so but he he adds that does not mean that the 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 images that came to me the visions i had with ayahuasca are any less important uh, mm -hmm. they are very important but for him personally uh the ones without ayahuasca just were completely unheard of Mm -hmm. completely unexpected. You do expect visions with ayahuasca, but he was having them without ayahuasca where he didn't expect it at all. And so it was much more um, striking, let me say. Um, Randy, could you s say whether there's a, any significant difference in the quality or the character of the visions that are had by ayahuasca? You've answered the question about their significance, their importance, but do they have a different feel? Do they have a different phenomenology? Tu pregunta es si la, la visión sin ayahuasca y las visiones con ayahuasca son distintas, son distintas. ¿Tú podías decir que son distintas o es la misma? No, mira, eh, las visiones con ayahuasca eh, y las visiones sin ayahuasca hay una diferencia, por ejemplo, en, cuando es con ayahuasca, es más colorido, digamos, y las visiones que yo tuve sin ayahuasca era, digamos, de un solo color, como por ejemplo, blanco, a veces puede ser verde, en cambio con ayahuasca es más colores, más poder, más okay. encendido. Era, eran, eran nítidas, ambas. Yeah. So he says, both visions were very clear. The difference is that the visions without ayahuasca were more monochromatic. Mm. Uh, either one color or just black and white, whereas the visions with ayahuasca is with lots of very strong colors, psychedelic colors, as we, as we call them. Mm. Yeah. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, so this goes back to uh, a point you made earlier, Frédéric. Uh, you've described in great detail in the book some of the challenges that Randy faced in this local in his local context, uh, including a widespread denigration of indigenous forms of knowledge among the predominant mestizo culture of Lamas. But I want to ask you instead about sorcery, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, Dr. Jacques Mabit was very keen to confirm that the, the disembodied master who initiated Randy was indeed not a sorcerer. So how does sorcery relate to shamanism in your local context? And how has Randy had to negotiate sorcery, whether it's real sorcerers or imputed sorcery? How has he had to negotiate that in his own practice? Well, uh, sorcery uh, and sorcerer called brujos 
in Spanish, uh, locally. Um, the thing, let me just start by saying in Lamas and in the region, uh, the word brujo, which literally means sorcerer, is often used to refer to curanderos, which means shaman mm -hmm. or medicine man, something like that. The healer literally means healer. Uh, but the, the vernacular or the colloquial expression to refer to such people is brujo. They're all brujos. Mm. Uh, to me, uh, this is a direct legacy of uh, the laws enacted uh, soon after the arrival of Pizarro uh, in what is now Peru and in 1531. And they enacted the laws of extirpation of idolatry and they persecuted uh, shamans and shamanesses, especially the women more than the men because this was going on in Spain and much of Western Europe at the time. So the, the Pope, Pope Innocent VIII, uh, declared uh, witches to be heretics and to be burned at the stake in 1484, way be, you know, before the, the, the invasion of the Americas. So um, that legacy is alive in the language. Uh, and, uh, and this is something he encounters daily. We encounter, I feel it as keen, probably more keenly than him. Um, I have a very mothering relationship with him and I want to protect him. But people, so when people say he's a brujo, I, I get all, you know, <laughs> reactive. Uh, but what happened in his very first session, the one I forced him to come where he was initiated, uh, he was presented during that session at, at a indigenous uh, Kichwa shaman. He was presented with choices, two, two roads. One was brilliantly lit flowers with two um, horsemen, gorgeously attired who said, come with us. You will have everything you ever wanted, all the money, all the women you ever wanted, come with us. And then there was another uh, dark uh, path uh, with a soft voice saying to him, no, come that way with us. And he went, he told me afterwards, he said, I was tempted by the, you know, the brilliant path, but I didn't choose it. And he, uh, he says that he's thanks to the, edu to the education of his parents. He chose the humble path. And if he had chose, chosen the other path, he would become a brujo, a sorcerer. Mm -hmm. So he doesn't do sorcery. Mm -hmm. uh, on the contrary, he is very good at identifying sorcery. He can see it in session who has done what, to whom, why, and he can undo it. It's actually a dangerous thing to do as those who will read the book will discover. Mm -hmm. uh, because the one, the sorcerer who did that gets furious at him and tries to get revenge. So it's not, it's a complicated path. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that, is that enough? Very clear, very clear. And implicit in your answer is the in the conviction that sorcery is real. Sorcery well, is a path within the broader kind it of is totally real. I have suffered from sorcery myself, mm -hmm. thanks to Randy, who this was before his initiation. He hired a specialist in removing, and it was very hard. But the sorcery was removed from me, and it worked. So sorcery is real. Is effective. I have been here for some 25 or more years, uh, and it can it can make you sick, deform, kill, and it's real. And what he does when people come with with symptoms, he immediately asks them, "Have you gone to the doctor? You know, the allopathic doctor, because he wants to eliminate that this is a natural cause." And and usually people come when the doctors can't identify, can't diagnose, and the person is very sick. And that's where he's able to diagnose the, the sorcery and remove it. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being so clear about that. 
All right. So I want to follow that up with a question about shamanism. So Frederic, you lean heavily on the category of shamanism throughout the book. Indeed, it's in the subtitle. And as you well know, this is a category that has been subjected to vigorous critique within the academy, not least because it was a category invented by 19th century ethnologists working with inner Asian traditions, but uh, and, and a, a category that then, uh, so to speak, went global in the 20th century to name a whole constellation of worldviews and practices spanning the history of this globe. Can you comment on your investment in the category of shamanism and its ongoing utility? Yes. Before uh, justifying my choice, I want to uh, preface this by saying that I completely understand why certain indigenous groups, especially in North America, but it doesn't happen in South America, but I know it happens in North America. Stefano is a close friend and he teaches in an indigenous studies department at, at Davis, University of California, Davis. <clears throat> and I completely understand that position that they want people to use the term they use, you know, and not generalize because of course there are different varieties of quote unquote shamanism or shamanic practice throughout the world. I recognize that and I respect that desire not to be homogenized into a very broad category that comes from somewhere else. I respect this, however, for me, uh, if I did not use the category of shamanism, I would never have discovered, which I did during the research for this book, that shamanism has been uh, eradicated in the West from way back when. And if you keep, you know, in, in a way that it has not in any other culture that I've ever come, of course, I can't can't say I've gone through every single culture, but you know, I've lived in different, very, I grew up in Morocco, I lived in India for years, lived here for years. Uh, and, and as a professional teacher of anthropology, you read a lot of ethnographies. And um, so uh, the reason that I, I am, for me, it was important to have that category. It was only through that category that this became visible for me. And this is absolutely central to my understanding of the West and how uh, the, uh, the role of this eradication, the role that this eradication played in the mechanistic revolution, so-called scientific revolution. Okay, thank you. Um... You know, I think it's a fascinating question as to which indigenous groups lay claim to the category of shamanism and which indigenous groups do not. And you, it's not something I know intimately, but it's been curious to see, I, my understanding is many of the South American indigenous groups have uh, laid claim to the category of shamanism. And it seems to me in some way, a way of congregating and um, joining forces with uh, both uh, other local groups, but also groups on other continents far flung. Um, yeah. So it, it, it is, it's a category that's doing very interesting yeah. um, political work for, right. uh, for indigenous groups globally as well. Yes. Absolutely, yes. Very uh, important. Uh, and I, as I recall from the book, you also said that some of the features that make Randy an unorthodox shaman in his local contexts become legible in the if you look to the literature on shamanism, including initiation by disembodied spirits. That initiation by disembodied spirits and some of the attacks that Randy uh, suffered at the hands of sorcerers were are very salient features of uh, the literature on shamanism, controversial literature on shamanism, say by Mircea Eliade. Uh, exactly, yeah. exactly. And that was, in fact, 
you know, I had forgotten, I, I had written, uh, read uh, Merci à Eliad in graduate school and I had forgotten him. <laughs> and when Randy told me about the brutal, that he thought he was going to die, that is, you know, they tried to kill him literally. And then I reread Eliad and I read a few others. And then his beating looked minimal compared to what is described. So right. this was very useful for me. It was very important to, to be able to see that. Interesting. I'm just gonna pause for a moment and remind our, our uh, guests that if anyone, we do have a, a number of questions in the queue, but uh, if you please do put comments or questions in the queue. Um, if you're sending them into the chat function, that's not ideal. Please copy paste them and put them in the Q and A. Thanks so much. Now I still have a few more questions for our guests. Um, so here at the CSWR this year, we have been hosting a very vibrant reading group on the tap the topic of what we're calling plant consciousness. Essentially, whether and how plants can be said to think, feel exert agency. And I wonder if either of you, Randy or Frederic, would like to comment on how plant consciousness is conceived and cultivated in this shamanic worldview and practice. I think the most obvious way is the way uh, Randy and others, other curanderos, uh, speak. Uh, and everybody, in fact, speaks that way. The plant told me. The plant healed me. The plant did this. The plant did that, mm -hmm. uh, the way people speak. And, uh, and it's meant literally. Uh, the plant, uh, whether it's, a, it's a, a psychedelic plant like the brew of ayahuasca, which is at least two different plants, or what they call master plants, which you take during what is called a dieta, which we would call a retreat, where uh, you, 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 you know, you don't, hardly eat anything, no salt, etc. And you take these master plants, the plants act on you. That's how people speak, how Randy speaks. And I have come to speak that way because I'm around him so much uh, and around here so much. And that's how I, I, I'm ending, I'm speaking that way and I don't, uh, and, and it's also my experience. I've done many retreats with master plants uh, in the course ayahuasca and many more ayahuasca sessions. I've done that for years and years and years. Um, and that's how I experience it. And this is how people speak. And I have come to speak of it when I speak Spanish here. Mm -hmm. So if I'm writing in English, then I become self-conscious and then I, I feel that I have to explain, you know, <laughs> because here it's taken as a given. And I believe, my, my belief is that the given comes in fact from uh, the indigenous, because this is a millenarian indigenous practice that many mestizos have taken up mm -hmm. or has been given uh, in his case, which is very unusual, extremely unusual. Uh, and that's how everybody talks about it. Uh, the plant has a spirit, has sentience, has intelligence, and I've experienced that. I mean, not only intelligence, but a wisdom. I was telling friends that came to a seminar I had just organized, and I was describing how I have been taught things by the plants through images. And one of them said, the depths of wisdom, and it's true. I mean, years, decades of psychoanalysis and psychotherapy did not achieve what these, these uh, images achieved for me. Extraordinary. And you cannot come out of that experience not knowing in your gut that the plant is acting and is acting not only intelligently, but with deep wisdom and great compassion. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. Now I see in the Q&A, thank you all the guests for uh, the a number of questions have just come in, some really wonderful questions um, and some for Randy um, and uh, Frederic for each of you. But I wanna ask you, um, Frederic, a question about the, the third part of your book, 
um, which is the where you shift back into a kind of uh, more academic idiom. Um, and it's very powerful. I, I, I'm not just saying that, you know, so many academic books are belabor their prose with uh, jargon, and there's very little of that. It's very clear. Um, in that third part you, part, you give a very lucid narrative of the destruction of shamanic traditions in early modern Europe, and then thereafter in those lands colonized by Europeans, including, of course, uh, as you put it, the invasion of the Americas. Can you tell our guests what you mean by the quote unquote enclosure movement in early modern Europe and its implications, especially for what you go on to call the enclosed self? Um, and you might want to uh, talk about that in relationship to the concept of the gift economy. But essentially, I want you to tell us what you what you see is important about that enclosure movement, the enclosed self, as it moves from early modern Europe and then into those lands colonized by Europeans. Yes, well, the enclosure movement, the enclosure of land in uh, Western Europe has been highly studied. Uh, and I am no historian, so it's not my specialty, but I've read as much as I could. Uh, and it, it, it really deals with the fact that with the decline of the manorial or feudal system, uh, the economic decline, powerful men, and I mean men, women were not involved, uh, aristocrats or, or wealthy merchants began uh, claiming uh, common lands where the people, uh, by putting a, an enclosure, literally, and doing what they called improving the land. And it was mostly because they needed new uh, revenues um, to boost their lifestyle. And there was a world trade in wool cloth. So they wanted to pasture their sheep. And they had to, to uh, enclose it uh, so that nobody else could enter it and drain and improve the pastures for their sheep. And this is the enclosure movement. They, uh, they were powerful people and men, and they were able to make their claims stick mostly in the courts mm. against the poor people who uh, made their living uh, growing food or hunting and gathering in these common lands. So that's the enclosure movement that grosso modo goes from the 14th century to the 18th century. Uh, what I call the enclosure of the self uh, is a process. So the enclosure of land transformed land into a commodity. Land was not a commodity. It was not up for sale. It was traditionally belonged to God and God's representative, the King of France and probably other, other kingdoms were like that. Um, and the enclosure of, so the commodification of land went also with the commodification of labor. Mm. Because then the people who used to have their livelihood growing food there could not, and they had to sell their labor power. So labor became a commodity. Now, to sell your labor power, you have to own it exclusively. Your labor power is yours. Now, we take this for granted and uh, an obvious thing, but it, when you compare it to how indigenous people do things uh, and act, then you realize you have to rethink this, what seems obvious to us today. What do they, how do they act? The world is alive has sentience, everything in it. Mountains, rivers, sun, moons, stars, etc. everything. Animals, plants, um, and they have, they have sentience and you, uh, you, you are one being among the many in the cosmos. Mm. So this has been called by Stefano Barelli, a cosmocentric uh, vision. Uh, paradigm, which is the opposite of our modern paradigm, which is anthropocentric, with human beings at the center, mm -hmm. uh, as special, different, and the mind of the humans being completely outside of the cosmos. 
so in a cosmocentric um, cosmocentric universe, uh, the human being is in relationship with all these sentient beings, be they the soil, be they the water, be they the animals, be they the plants, be they the, the stars, the moon, the sun, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what does that mean? You treat them like elder relatives with greater respect than people your age. And you reciprocate because you realize that there is no, you cannot live without their gifts. Agriculture is the product of soil, water, sun, moon, so many, right? And there's an awareness and therefore there's always a reciprocating gift, mm. offering, if you will, uh, to these spirits. Mm -hmm. Spirits means it, it has sentience, it has agency, uh, it has will, etc. cetera. Uh, so um, when, uh, with labor becoming a commodity, the labor to, uh, to do your reciprocity with all these other beings in the cosmos that are often communal, they're called festivals, fiestas, uh, ceremonies, they're called many things, and they're often com communal, and uh, they are considered, uh, my ex was an economist and we did work together, critiques of development. In development, this is considered unproductive labor, mm -hmm. traditional, and it, you know, waste of time, in other words. It does not produce wealth, so you have to leave it behind. Whereas in the cosmocentric uh, paradigm, you have to reciprocate part of your energy, part of your, what we call labor power, uh, goes to not only your human community, but your non-human and other than human community. By other than human, I mean usually what we tend to call supernaturals. Mm. So, uh, to uh, here I, I use the work of Marcel Mauss, the early French anthropologist, uh, nephew of Durkheim, actually, Alsatian, like me. <laughs> um, and uh, Marcel Mauss wrote a very famous book, Essay sur le don, on the gift. And uh, there, and I quote him in the book, uh, he says, uh, he takes a Maori example from New, New Zealand and about hunting some birds and then part of the birds uh, are given to priests who make an offering that is offered to the spirit of the birds. But most rites, actually, what is going on is relation gifts between human beings. So this has kind of not that it's changing lately, but all of my training and, and most of my reading when I was in academia, uh, this is seen as, as uh, true. Uh, and spirits and other beings, deities, etc., are considered beliefs, collective human beliefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas I have changed. That's why I'm a heretical anthropologist. <laughs> I don't take them as a collective human belief. I think they, because of my experience, uh, they really do exist with sentience, with will, with agency, mm -hmm. with wisdom and compassion. Thank you. I think in light of the time, I'm going to transition to some of the questions from the audience, which have been pouring in. Some of them are very, very astute. So I'm going to start with a simple one, but it, well, it's a simple question, but the answer is not simple, I imagine. And it's a question for Randy. The question is, have the disembodied spirits had anything to say to you about what they think about ayahuasca coming to the United States. Or you might say ayahuasca being 
engaged outside of its local religious um, cultural contexts. La pregunta es de la audiencia. Uh, la pregunta si tú te, te enteraste en tus visiones o de otra manera eh, sobre lo que está pasando, que el ayahuasca va en avión, va a Estados Unidos, ¿no? Eh, allí hace cuestiones de ayahuasca. ¿Y ¿Qué piensas tú de eso? ¿Qué, qué has aprendido sobre lo que tu, tu opinión sobre esa práctica? <coughs> Eh, yo pienso que cada planta, eh, así como la ayahuasca, la guachuma, el peyote, que tiene sus lugares, y hay que ver tal vez, o sea, cada planta es su lugar. La otra ya es algo ya mm, un poco comercial. So what he said is that his opinion is that uh all the plants all these he mentioned the psychotropic plants like ayahuasca like peyote and other such uh really ought to remain where they belong where they grow hmm. the amazon basin the upper amazon uh and not not be exported you can see sees that as uh, a kind of a commercialization of uh, of shamanism. Mm. I see. So, does it follow that some of the uh, traditions that have emerged from Amazonia? I'm thinking of, say, Santo Daime, which have which have brought ayahuasca to very very diverse uh, environments. That that is the traditions like that are viewed with some concern or suspicion. He he does. He does. Okay. He would. Yes. Mm -hmm. He would. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, there's so many good questions here. It's hard to pick. Uh, here's one that engage <laughs> that has to do with Joseph Campbell. This is from Nicholas. Thank you, Nicholas. You've posted a number of really really good questions. Nicholas asks, can you tell me about how shamanic initiation might fit, fit in with the framework of Joseph Campbell's quote unquote hero's journey, specifically the refusal of the call? Can Randy or Frederic, can you tell us more about Randy's attempt to resist the call, how he was and how he was compelled to carry on with it? Is this a pattern in shamanic initiations in Peru or other shamanic traditions in uh, Central and, and South America? Well, I will only talk about what I know, which is here in Peru and what I've learned here. And I'll speak for him because we've discussed these things many, many times. And so he will spare us the, the translation time. Um, he didn't want this initiation. He didn't want to go. I forced him to go. And uh, when uh, after the, the severe beating where he thought he was going to die, and they take him to elders uh, who said, now you have passed the test and we're going to give you powers to help others. And he says, why me? I'm not interested. He tries. They ignore him they ignore him and at the very end of the first initiation which is, which is very full and very complex uh, uh, a golden uh, spear appears with a hand giving it to him and against his will but automatically his hand raises and takes it which means he accepts it so we've discussed that many times he and i uh, and what he finally uh, came to say is that the will of the discounted beings overwhelmed his own will. Mm -hmm. He tried to quit. It, it lasted three and a half years, this thing, this intense uh, initiation. Midway, he, he received a magical dart that was unbelievably painful. And he said, okay, this is it. This is my last session. I'm going. 
to this last, and this will be my last session. I want my whole life back, simple, no difficulty, uh, no suffering. And so he's doing, he, you know, he, he does the ceremony, the trance goes down and he says, okay, now I'm leaving. And at the moment of leaving, the Virgin appears, mm. huge, and tells him, I'm giving you powers to help others. And his whole body gets covered. He, he has made a, a tattoo out of it. This whole body was covered with snakes. And, and it was very hard, but he, he, had to, he had to bear it. And, that, and, and at the end uh, of that session, the Virgin talks to him and says, I want you to build my image. And he says, where? And she shows him. And it's very near here, in, in a spring, a natural spring, a beautiful place, very near here, nice. which he did. Uh, we all participated in this. Um, so that changed it. That, that uh, apparition of the, the Virgin, then he decided to accept this past. And he has accepted the past with all its dangers and difficulty, but he has been able to get along the way protection. That's key to be able to continue on this path. Protections from the mountain, the sacred mountain, from the Virgin and other spirits. Not surprisingly, there's a number of questions about sorcery, I think prompted by your very clear affirmation of its reality and efficacy. So one question is, considering that ayahuasca is such a powerful force for good for many people, how do we explain the brujo phenomenon? How do we explain sorcery? Why do spirits give sorcerers power? Are they bad spirits? Um, if ayahuasca opens the mind to some of the mechanisms of life, the mind, the universe, why do the sorcerers not see that path, that their own path is a negative one with negative consequences? La pregunta es por qué el brujo, los que hacen daño, porque la, la ayahuasca te cura, ¿no? Para saber cosas. ¿Y cómo sucede que brujos quieren hacer daño? ¿Cómo sucede eso? Mira, <inaudible> de la persona que va a hacer daño. Entonces, son el equipo ahí que todo porque eso es un tema muy delicado y que es lo, lo más fácil que puede aprender alguien que quiere que el grupo. So, his answer is that ayahuasca, the ayahuasca brew can be used for good or bad, mm. for healing or for harming. And for harming, the sorcerer, on, you know, when you do an ayahuasca ceremony, you have an altar and he places certain things and gets the help of certain entities to, uh, to do harm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a business. Locally, it's a business. Uh, you know, jealousy, uh, your husband has gone with another woman and the wife hires a sorcerer to with vengeance against usually the other woman, or that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And it's done in ayahuasca ceremonies. Mm -hmm. uh, you just invoke different, you have a different altar. I don't know what it's like, he, he, didn't, he doesn't know either. I mean, he sees it in vision. He can see the sorcerer, who has done it, to whom. Uh, the, the, he tells me these things. I, I'm amazed by it, but that's what he tells me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, and it's it can be used for good or bad. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like implicit in your answer is that the entities themselves 
are ambiguous. Some of them are good. Some of them have their, uh, their own purposes, aims and purposes. So it's not just that the sorcerer is the, 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 the source of the bad intentions, that the entities themselves may right. be right. influences. Is that when correct? He, I mean, in the book, there's, you know, the, the, where he's having the session with an old friend, and a friend of mine as well, older man, who, and out of the body of this older man comes this um, evil uh, entity with a huge saber, mm -hmm. which Randy at first partially neutralized, but he receives a magical dart, which really hurts. And then the second time, he completely neutralizes this uh, evil entity. And then he says, I'm done. And that's when the version appears. And everyone changes his life. So yes, evil entities appear and exist. That's all I can say. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't say more. We'll leave that. that to the theologians. Uh, why they are what <laughs> I said. We can leave that question to the theologians. <laughs> to the theologians, exactly. <laughs> um, Frederic, this is a, a challenging question from one of our guests who said who writes. Three times you, Frederic, have said that you forced, forced Randy to drink ayahuasca. I find this language troubling. Under what circumstances is it ethical to force another person to ingest a psychotropic plant? Let me, let me clarify. I didn't force him to drink. Mm -hmm. I forced him to accompany me. There was a foreign couple, uh, he was Peruvian and his wife was American, and she needed to do some field work on Amazonian plants. And they wanted to do an ayahuasca ceremony. And this was before his initiation. So he didn't know anything about Amazonian plants, med medicinal plants. So he asked a friend to teach them. And this friend, they asked the friend, we want to do an ayahuasca ceremony, take us. And I felt obliged to go because uh, strictly speaking, legally, I am responsible for the safety of students who come to my center. So I felt I had to go and make sure they would be all right mm -hmm. to go with them. I couldn't just let them go with uh, this other person that, and I didn't know, the three of them very well, very lightly. So it was a long trip and it would be overnight. It would end up being, uh, you know, many hours on the road or two or three hours on the road, partly on the boat, on the pirogue, etc. And I simply didn't want to be alone with people I did not know. So I asked him to accompany me, he said, no. Mm. I said, you have to accompany me. I didn't force him to, ingest anything or even to participate. I didn't know if he was going to do the, the ceremony. He just showed up, he was there with us. He could have not come to the ceremony. I did that I would not have forced him to do, come to the ceremony. That has to be his own decision. But he, he was there, he, he came with us. I did not force him to come to the ceremony. I forced him to accompany me to the trip, in the trip, because I didn't know these people very much. Uh, that's what I forced him to do. Yes, okay. indeed, I did. Okay. Well, that's a very important clarification. So thank you for making that clarification. I hope that puts uh, our questioner's heart at rest. Um, all right, I have one more question. And then um, I almost want to, well, their questions are coming in, but I also want to ask you if there's any questions you wish you had been asked so uh, if there's something you want to, but, but that's not the question I have right now. I'm just putting that out there um, before we conclude. So someone has asked, um, hold on, let me see. Yes, um, I've heard an ayahuasquero talk down other shamanic medicines, such as San Pedro or psilocybin, uh, hailing ayahuasca as a more true medicine. Is this uh, a common pattern, uh, one of sort of making a hierarchy or uh, of these different uh, plant medicines? Um, and if so, why? This is absolutely typical. Uh, the first uh, uh, 
shamanic session I did was not with ayahuasca. It was with a datura plant called locally tomapende. I don't know what its scientific name. It's very strong. Uh, and the, the shaman who, who did that uh, with me and friends that came with me uh, was typical. Uh, dear old friend, he was a neighbor. I went there all the time. I knew him very well. He said, you know, forget about ayahuasca. Tomapende is the only right thing. <laughs> You will hear that. And, you know, if you are Wachumero, which is San Pedro, if you are, whatever you do is the best. That's typical. There's nothing unusual in that. Uh, what one does is the best. I stuck, I did uh, Tomapende only a few times. And uh, I started ayahuasca because my host told me that's what we do. And, you know, as a good anthropologist, when in Rome, you do like the Rome, you know, you do whatever they ask you. And I said, yes. And I discovered that this was, I stuck with it because it opened up amazing mm -hmm. uh, horizons uh, for my, which I realized very soon uh, for my spiritual development. Uh, and so I stuck with ayahuasca because it was extraordinary. It was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't say it's the best, but it's the, what I know and uh, what I know best. Uh, but I haven't tried, I've tried Tomapende. It's very powerful, uh, but, and I can't tell you why I prefer ayahuasca, but I do, I do. Okay. Here's, I'm gonna combine two questions that are both uh, aimed, uh, are addressed to Randy. Uh, now these are this this is something that's actually I know the answer to this question is in the book, but I'm going to pose it for those who haven't yet read the book. The question is essentially how have Randy's family and friends reacted to this initiation and this initiation into shamanism? How have the people of your community reacted, uh, both the the mestizo community in which he was raised? Um, as well as the indigenous community, um, uh, uh, the, the, the um, Kikwa Lama, am I saying it right? Kichwa Lamas? Kichwa uh, Lamas, yeah. Yeah, Kichwa Lamas community. And, and how have these different reactions, friends, family, mestizo, indigenous, how have all these different re reactions kind of landed with Randy himself personally? I can translate, but I also know the answer. Okay. <laughs> I've known him since he's 15. Okay. He's like a son. And it saves us the work. But I will translate after I have answered to make sure that there's not something else he wants to say. Most importantly, uh, it's been... What's the word I want to use? Very painful. He has lost his parents' uh, attention. I don't think he's lost their love, but uh, there's a very strong... Uh, I have lost a sister, and his mother was my right arm, was my sister. Uh, and so I've lost her, he's lost the closeness with them. Mm -hmm. So the price has been very high. But it has to do also, it has to do partly because I try to talk to his parents a lot. Uh, and uh, in part, it has to do with losing his former partner, mm -hmm. whom his mother was extremely, and I think continues to be extremely fond of. Uh, but his current partner and the mother of his first child who was born two weeks ago, She's a baby up there. <laughs> um, uh, so he could not have a child with the first person. And the current partner was designated to him by the spirits who told him, she's going to be your wife. You're going to have a child with her, which has happened. Uh, but he, he's paid a high price for it, very high price. Uh, his close friends, most of them uh, have not only accepted, but come to him for help. And he has healed 
many of them are very serious, sometimes physical problems, sometimes uh, addiction, sometimes, you know, different mental, mental problems. Mm. Um, a few, but very few uh, for specific reasons have kind of uh, rejected him, but very few. Most of them um, have become even more friends and very grateful for having been healed by him. La, la pregunta era cómo tu, tu entorno, tus amigos, tu familia han reaccionado al hecho de que fuiste iniciado. Y yo dije algo sobre tus padres que se alejaron, porque que no la mencioné, pero tu previa, uh, que ellos querían mucho, tu madre quería mucho. Uh, y pero que los espíritus te hayan dicho que Tarito sería tu mujer, porque ya tienes tu hijo ahora. ¿Quieres decir algo más? Sí. So I ask you, does he want to say something else? I quickly translated what I told you. He says that's fine. One follow-up question I have is, uh, were there any skeptics among the indigenous uh, community that is there is there any question of um, of someone like Randy from the mestizo community being initiated? Is there any resistance to non-indigenous being initiated uh, to do this shamanic work? No, not at all. Uh, there are plenty. I've, I've done ayahuasca with many mestizos mm -hmm. as well as indigenous uh, shamans. This is common. Uh, there's a class issue there. They tend to be, the mestizo shamans don't tend to be the upper class. Mm -hmm. uh, they tend to be more from the, uh, the peasant class. Uh, it's, you can't say it's a rule, but the tendency is like that. Mm -hmm. It's totally accepted. Uh, Kichuas go to, to mestizo shamans. Uh, our, one of our uh, very valued uh, indigenous uh, collaborator who works here now part-time has done uh, many sessions with him, as has his wife, his Kichwa wife. So they come to Mestizo Shamans. Uh, it's really the, the reason for coming to, to a shaman is the shaman's reputation. Mm -hmm. And Randy, this, Randy has done stunning healings. I mean, absolutely amazing things. And the word gets out. Mm -hmm. People come, whatever, whoever they are. Mm. And they have come to him. Frederick, do you want to say anything about the center that you're directing? Because it's, it's, it, it's woven into the book and it's adjacent to many of the things you've talked about tonight, but not, you haven't really addressed it. And I think it might be helpful for you to speak about um, your efforts in agricultural revitalization and trying right. to bring forward um, these kind of suppressed indigenous ways of, uh, well, not just ways of, of knowing yeah. um, uh, and, 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 you know, that are fighting against really. Yes, brutal... yes. one of my uh, first and main project uh, thing about his initiation came to all of us as a total surprise and it has changed all of our lives but I haven't stopped doing what I started doing and I started uh, trying to regenerate the most amazing soil it's called by scientists anthropogenic meaning made by humans I don't like that term uh, because it's 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 a cosmocentric Soil. It's made by humans, but by all the other entities in the cosmos as well. Uh, so that's a ca caveat, I would say. And it's uh, its oldest uh, layers you know, discovered by archaeologists quite a while back. Uh, but the, the, so the serious work began in the 60s, I believe, 50s and 60s of last century. And, uh, and the oldest strata have been dated as uh, being 8,000 years old by soil scientists at Cornell. 
Uh, so this is an amazing soil uh, made uh, by humans and other entities and uh, full of broken ceramics. Mm -hmm. And what's published on it by mostly scientists doesn't say anything about the ceramics, but one of my Kichwa collaborator, I discovered through his grandmother that it comes from offerings to the spirits of the, of the field. So we do this and Reiner, our indigenous specialist, who's taught me the little Kichwa that I know and many other things, uh, leads us in the ceremonies uh, of offerings, you know, this reciprocity, uh, this unenclosed self that I tried for many years. I, I, I taught uh, study abroad courses here for undergraduate and sometimes graduate students from US and Canada, and uh, where we did these things uh, because, uh, you know, I don't force people to do them, but usually they want to do it. Uh, they always join in these rituals. So, I don't know where, where I was going with this. Okay. Well, I, maybe I can jump in because one of the things that I found so interesting is that it sounds that it sounds as if the scientists working on this anthropogenic soil, so-called anthropogenic soil, didn't really know how to interpret the the existence of broken ceramics, and they attributed it to middens which are essentially ancient yeah. trash heaps trash heaps yes yeah so they, they but but still that didn't seem to explain its ubiquity why is why exactly. were there why are there broken ceramics in the soil exactly. uh, everywhere uh, when it when it doesn't seem like the ceramic the broken ceramics um are providing any obvious um organic function to the soil and what what i gather you're you are proposing based on an indigenous uh, a testimony and yeah. also uh, uh, the testimony of an archaeologist and, an ar and the archaeologist, yeah, archaeologist is that this proves or, or suggests at the very least that the creation of this soil is a collaborative effort in which the humans understand themselves as making offerings to disembodied or either non-human or other than human entities and so the soil isn't, this is why the soil isn't really anthropogenic because even the humans don't understand themselves as doing all the work. Exactly. And they're, and, and they're involved in a, in a gift economy with a whole host of other beings. Exactly. And they're exactly. giving, and they're giving these, this very precious ceramics to those beings. Right. Uh, yeah, it completely changes our understanding of what the efficacy of the soil is. At least. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So this is an example of a non-enclosed non self. You are in constant reciprocity with all the, be the other beings, mm -hmm. not only, you are also with humans, but not only with humans, right. as Mas and Mus insisted. Yes, 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 yeah. Fascinating. Well, thank God we're, in, we're in, involved in an economy with more than human beings. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Yeah, Absolutely. that might that, that might be our only hope. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, um, I have run out of my questions, and I think we've we've been through a, a good number of the the questions that came through uh, from the audience. I suppose in closing, I just want to invite Randy, you or or you, Frederic, to to say anything you you wish to that you haven't had a chance to say. Bueno, eh, sobre la Virgen, desde el momento que apareció la primera vez, eh, la experiencia con Bismardo y las dos fuerzas por la que nos esa experiencia con Bismardo fue lo, lo más crucial para yo tomar la decisión de porque lo vi como un respaldo entonces que lo llamamos nosotros es como mi patrona 
o una aliada, puede ser el sermón o así, la fiesta, la lecha, chía, son aliadas, pero la persona principal es ella. Es ella. So what he, he just said, he, he wanted to say that, you know, I, I, I said very clear, uh, quickly, I told the story when he finally decided to accept this path, after he had decided to give it up, when the Virgin of Guadalupe appeared. And he wants to say that uh, she especially is his patron, but not only she, uh, the woman Wasi, the sacred mountain is also, but also the Hindu god Ganesh, the Hindu god Shiva, especially Shiva Nataraj, have appeared to him, have, gave, have given him powers and others. And uh, he wants to say that uh, their patronage and their help uh, have become crucial to him and are what made him accept the path halfway through. No, after had it, uh, trying to quit. He said, we had a long conversation the other night where he spoke so poetically, it was beautiful. And now he's referring to it. And uh, he was explaining to me um, that when he, when he heals, when he leads a ceremony and he's trying to heal, he says, I am not healing. I am the one image he, he, he used several, but the one that stuck with me, he says, I'm like a flute and the Virgin or the others are blowing mm. and it goes through me, but I'm not the author of it. It comes from above. And that's how healing happens. That's beautiful. Well, that seems like a wonderful image with which to close this evening <laughs> a beautiful poetic image so thank you again both of you frederic and randy for this rich book and this rich conversation and thank you thank all you. Oh, thank you charles for inviting us very much it's a delight <laughs> and it's such a wonderful way to begin this uh re-begin this series um in fact this semester we're going to have a whole host of events um uh, many of which will be dealing with um uh ayahuasca traditions so oh, wow. um, I'll, I'll be i'll be joining if i'm here if i'm uh if i can we're, we're both traveling a lot with book presentation to europe and other places so uh, I'll be moving around a lot, but I I'll try to come to those because, as you know, very interesting. Thank you. They're always, so they're always recorded and we right. will distribute them. So there's, if you can't attend in person, that, that's great. Right. Um, we have um, Bill Barnard coming, who's just written a book on <laughs> liquid, liquid light on uh, the uh, Santo Daime tradition. Um, anyway, I'll, th if those of you who are joining, if you're not subscribe to our newsletter please do so that's the best way to find out about these talks they're not yet on our website because not all the details are finalized but um uh in any case for those of you who are joining us we still have a good number of people with us thank you so much and um uh in the meantime i wish you all well frederick and randy thank you again for the Please come to see me when you're back in Cambridge. We need to. I will. I definitely will. <laughs> okay. Bye. Thank, Thank you all. Bye. Good night. Good evening. Good night. Sponsor Center for the Study of World Religions. Copyright 2023. The President and Fellows of Harvard College.